welcome you here today, and, and I'm just honored to be here. I, uh, I, uh, I, love, I love this area, and I'll tell you a little bit more about myself. My name is Justin Donovan, and I'm uh, currently living in Park Rapids right now. I just wanted to take some time to talk about uh, developing an outreach mindset. And this kind of, I, I don't know how, how you work when it comes to, if you have the opportunity to preach or teach regularly at your particular congregation, whether it's in small groups or Bible studies or even preaching from the pulpit, but I find so much uh, of my life is gathering shared experiences and kind of putting them into different files in my brain. And so when I think about outreach, uh, this stuff comes uh, over the course of, I've been in ministry for, in some capacity or another, for since the fall of 2003. Uh, so um, this is just stuff that's come over, uh, over the course of that time. So I'd love to begin in prayer and then we can get rolling. God, thanks again for this opportunity. Thank you, God, for each of the congregations that are involved in this time this after or this morning. We just want to thank you again for the gift of your presence, Lord. We acknowledge that apart from your presence in our life and your work through us, God, that uh, our outreach has no power. And God, that your desire is that uh, the kingdom the kingdom of this world would become the kingdom of our God. And so God, we ask that you would empower our hearts and minds during this time that ideas would be brought to our head and as we go through this time. Speak through me, and we just thank you. Amen. Amen. Well, we are, we're going to be talking a little bit about developing an outreach mindset, and I thought, especially in light of the holiday we just had, uh, yesterday was St. Patrick's Day, and uh, such a great holiday, unfortunately, kind of becomes like most holidays in the United States or Western Europe, another excuse to get drunk, but if you're familiar at all with the story of, of St. Patrick, his story of evangelism and outreach is a powerful one. And uh, he was in the early years of the church, I believe it was 6th uh, sixth, sixth century, and he grew up in a Christian family in uh, what we would call England. And uh, he was kidnapped by a, group of, uh, by a group of pirates and brought up to the, the, Ireland, uh, the, the island of Ireland and spent a number of years there as uh, working with animals. I think it was a sheep herder or a pig herder or something like that. But he was not a very religious young man back home, kind of a... Maybe you'd call him a cradle Christian, I guess. But when he got to Ireland, he de developed in a lot of his time alone, maybe like King David from the Bible, developed a real dynamic prayer life and this ongoing kind of dialogue with God. And uh, not only that, but as, as you would do in any sort of context, he, he developed a real deep understanding of uh, the, the Irish context, of the things they valued. They were certainly not Christian people there. They were uh, Druids, basically, like if you think of modern-day earth worship or or Wicca, that's, that was the religion they practiced. And it was said that one night he had a dream. And in that dream that God sort of gave him a way to escape and to leave, and so he did. And he got on a boat and then through this kind of miraculous, uh, miraculous event was able to get in the boat and go back home, found his family, and uh, was training for the ministry. And uh, Patrick was training for the ministry, but again, in a dream one night, he saw this Irish boy that said, come back to Ireland and live among us, Patrick. And so that was kind of his divine call to go there and went there as a missionary bishop to start, uh, start churches uh, in, in, in Ireland there. And the reason this idea of Celtic evangelism, there's been lots of books uh, printed about it, is so unique <coughs> is because as opposed to uh, the very very, not, I don't want to say rigid, but very directed, very Roman way that the church had operated for, for that first two, three hundred years of the established institutional church. Patrick, instead of looking, saying, hey, let's make these people good Roman citizens uh, that, that live in dioceses and parishes, let's, let's, let's communicate the gospel to them in a way that is, again, uh, Steve used the word relevant, I kind of hate that word, but that's, that, that fits the context of who they are. And so here's a couple things that, um, the way it, way it looked like. Uh, his strategy, it says that it included a team that would set up a camp near a settlement and engage with the local leader. In their context, meeting the local chieftain or the local leader of the village was the quickest way uh, to influence the people as a whole. And he would converse with everybody, he'd pray for the sick, he'd make open air uh, presentations of the gospel and culturally familiar forms, including story, story, poetry, parable, symbol, and drama, all the, um, with the goal of planting a church. And then the church would begin and take place, and uh, monastic communities uh, would offer a place of hospitality that was free from violence. 
and all the different things that they valued as a people. Now, we're not talking about uh, what's the dreaded word uh, when people, Paul, help me out, what's that, syncretism? Then we're not talking about syncretism, we're talking about values that are already there, good values, godly values that were already in place, and that they would, uh, they would capitalize on that and use that. And so when they talked, they would talk about things like the Trinity. They would talk about things like sacrifice. They would talk about God's presence with them. They would talk about uh, human nature. And they would adapt this to their audience in, in such a way that uh, the church in Ireland grew and became one of the great missionary forces in the, in the West. And great monastic communities developed out of there. If you ever hear of people like St. Patrick or St. Columba or St. Iona or St. Bridget, Amazing things. Uh, if you go to Ireland now, they have the Book of Kells, which is this beautiful hand-decorated copy of the Bible. And so when we think about developing a, a ministry or a, a, an outreach mindset, that's really what we're talking is about. Each of us is in a particular context, whether you live in Bagley or Clearbrook, or whether you live in uh, Shevlin, or whether you live in Cass Lake, or whether you live down where I live in Park Rapids. Uh, we each have a certain context that we're working with and trying to really pay attention to what God's already doing and, uh, and, and what, what resonates uh, with, with the folks that are there. So, before I keep talking, who is this guy? My name is Justin Damagala. I, uh, I'm actually a graduate of Oak Hills Christian College. I graduated in 2003. I did it in four years, so that was kind of like my one, <laughs> my one uh, thing I felt pretty proud about there with my college education. But I grew up in Alexandria, Minnesota, and a uh, great, great community. Um, if you've ever been through Alexandria, if you need a job, if you want a good place to raise your kids, if you like beautiful lakes, it's a good, it's a good place to be from. Brought up in a Christian home, and I uh, just had the great privilege of that, and, and church has always been a part of my life uh, in some form or another. Obviously, Sunday morning attendance and Sunday school and youth group and mission trips and sort of a typical, I would say, uh, Christian, Christian experience or maybe evangelical Christian experience. My wife, Renee, grew up in... Uh, actually grew up in the, the community of Nevis, which is just a little bit east of where I live in Park Rapids. We've got some folks here from Nevis today, and uh, she grew up there and then did a, graduated in Staples, and we actually connected uh, in Staples a number of years later, and she's just been, and I talk to people, I'm like, if you want proof that there's a God, I, uh, I look at my wife and I say, you know, there's no reason that she would marry me. And so um, I, I just, I'm so blessed to have her. We have four children. Actually, Pastor Chris Conger here performed our wedding and, and Kathy was so instrumental in, in, our, uh, in our courtship and, and marriage as well. I have four children. My oldest, Maria, is six. She'll be seven next month. Uh, our second is Maddie. She just turned five here in February. Our, uh, our little girl, Bailey, turned four in February. And our son, Abel, is one. He'll be two next month. So the answer to the question is, yes, we're very busy. We have a lot of life going on. And, uh, and um, it's full and we love it. I've had the opportunity uh, since I got out of college to work at White Oak Bible Chapel here, and I know there's a number of folks from White Oak Bible Chapel. I was there for two years as a youth pastor and just learned so much about, again, about outreach and about meeting people and uh, about the importance of prayer and study. And uh, after that, I had the opportunity actually to serve with uh, Paul Straubel over here. We worked together two and a half years. I was in uh, the Red Lake Indian Reservation, the village of Redby, and my life was nothing but outreach there and had a great opportunity. Uh, meeting with people and, and uh, getting to know people. One of my favorite stories from up there um, was uh, there was Saturday night, and that's a, apparently a pretty bustling night in the Red Lake community, and it was about 11 o'clock, and I had a flat tire, and my tire went flat on me before I, about five miles before I could cross, cross the line and get back, into, uh, get back on the other side, and um, it was kind of funny. I was able to drive my car about a mile to my friend Richard's house, who just, just lived up the road. I couldn't get the trunk of my car open at that time. He changed my tire for me. We visited for an hour, and about one in the morning, I headed home, no problem. So it was a great, it was a great opportunity, a great place, and, and so thankful for that opportunity. I was able to serve seven and a half years. We moved from there to the community of Staples, and uh, we served seven and a half years with, uh, at the Staples Church of Christ. The Staples is right in central Minnesota. I just had an awesome time there growing, and I, I did a lot of work with students. I was an associate pastor, and a lot of, a lot of again, a lot of outreach kind of stuff. At, at, toward the end of my tenure, I was kind of the community youth pastor, so to speak, and had a lot of time getting to visit with students in the school, knew a lot of people. I can still go back there today and tell you who's driving in what car and who's that walking on the sidewalk. And uh, it was just a, a great opportunity to get to know 
uh, so many not only in our own church but also to get to know a lot in the outside community and currently right now uh, we're serving with Eastside Christian Church. Eastside Christian Church is actually a, a church that's in California. Uh, we work, we're a multi-site church, that means we're one church, but we have three different campuses where you might call us a satellite church. We have video preaching, and so that's uh, interesting and new, but it's been wonderful and actually really, I feel like, been really effective. And, um, and so that's a whole different story that I'll tell you about in a little bit. But the point of the matter is I've, I've grown up in churches my entire life of churches about around the size of 100 or 150, even less. The church I attended in college was... I think 20, and uh, and so I I I'm, I love I love this area of the state. I love Northern Minnesota. I'm excited about what God is doing here, uh, and I'm so uh, excited about what God can do through 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 small churches and rural churches. And it's really a privilege to be able to to be here and talk to you a little bit more about that today. And the reason I titled my 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 talk is Beyond Skinny Jeans, is. Um, is because I just had, it came from an interaction I had with a pastor friend, a dear pastor friend of mine who's been serving in the ministry for almost 40 years had come to a place where he thought, you know, we're not, we're not attracting the young people like we should be, and, and uh, maybe if I wore jeans, maybe if I wore jeans, that would be kind of like the linchpin that would help bring people in. And, um, you know, if you live in a logging community where the fanciest, fanciest people have are some clean car hearts and a clean flannel, maybe, but this is a guy that wears a, wears a button-up shirt and slacks to go get the mail. You know what I mean? That's who he is. That's who he is. And so the, the name of the game here is that outreach, when we're talking about outreach, this isn't a, it's not a gimmick. It's not a technique, and it's not a strategy for church, church growth. Justin Welby is the leader of the Church of England, and he is the, the shepherd, the archbishop of 80 million people. And he said, and one thing I thought, he, it was awesome, his talk on evangelism is one of the best talks I've heard in the last probably three years. And he said, evangelism, if you know anything about the Church of England, it's certainly dying in England. It's, it's growing in the global south, but it's dying in England. And he said, evangelism, he said, the most important thing a person can do is know and walk with Jesus Christ. And he said, evangelism is not a strategy for church growth. And I was, that, that really struck me. It's a mandate of God. And this is one of my favorite passages in the New Testament. It comes from 2 Corinthians 5, probably familiar uh, to many of you, where he says this, Since then we know what it is to fear the Lord, we try to persuade men. What we are is plain to God, and I hope it's also plain to your conscience. We're not trying to commend ourselves to you again, but are giving you an opportunity to take pride in us so that you can answer those who take pride in what is seen rather than what is in the heart. If we are out of our mind, it is for the sake of God. If we are in our right mind, it is for you. For Christ's love compels us because we're convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. All of this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us, now this is here, that we have been reconciled and, and Christ gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though Christ were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. This wonderful mandate in the context of what God has done in our life, and I don't know how many of us in here grew up in the church, that that's been a, a pretty foundational part of our entire life. How many of us are maybe uh, came, to, came to faith in our teens or even later in life? But this awesome privilege that we have of being ambassadors and that everything we do, uh, not just as pastors and church leaders, but as human beings, we have that opportunity to be able to outreach to people and to help people see and know the awesome power and love of God and this God that has reached out to us by taking on flesh and coming and living among us. And so I wanted to talk about outreach. You know, I was, I was thinking about it, I guess I'm a, I don't know if I'm a three-point sermon guy here or whatever, but I was thinking of three different contexts 
in which we do outreach. Because outreach isn't some just monolithic thing. I used to think, well, outreach is just simply going out and finding all the crackheads in your community and winning them to faith. Now, that's a dimension of that. I'm not saying it's not. And, and we certainly... We, we certainly, I'm from Hubbard County. There's a lot of crackheads that we can reach for Jesus. So any Hubbard County people in here? My Hubbard County people in here, amen. And so that's part of it. I'm not saying that that's not part of it, but we outreach is not some monolithic thing that this is all it is. Outreach is really a mindset, like we said, uh, of seeing every person as created by God. And really, I believe as ministers, as church leaders, our, our job is really to help people take the next step. Whatever that next step is. If you've been walking with the Lord for 50 years, you have a next step with Jesus. If you've been walking with the Lord for 50 minutes, you have a next step with Jesus. So whatever that is. Um, so first thing I wanted to talk about is just some things to think about. And, and I'm doing this in line of our east side, kind of our, our vision or our mission. And we have a couple different uh, phrases that we use to think about different uh, environments or uh, whatever you want to say for doing outreach. First one is pursuing God. And that's our Sunday morning that we have that we pursue God, we gather for Sunday worship. That's an, that's an outreach context. Uh, number two, building community. And that's when we talk about our, our smaller, a little bit more personal groups. Um, we call them, we have small groups. We have kids side for our students. Maybe you call it Sunday school or Bible studies. And also for serving groups. Interestingly enough, volunteer groups of one or two. Well, yeah, one person's not a group. Uh, volunteer groups of two or three or four people getting together for a service on a Sunday morning or other serving uh, opportunities at your church. That is a smaller group where people can build some great community together. And then finally, unleashing compassion. And that's really, uh, I think when we think of outreach, that's really what we think of, what comes to our mind first in terms of outreach is, what are we doing in terms of helping our community, whether it's in outright social ways. We think of things like maybe um, a couple, uh, this past Tuesday, our small group went and served uh, at Helen's Kitchen, which is a local uh, food shelf ministry. I know Pastor Paul over at... Um, over at Grace and Osage over there, every week there's a community breakfast where people are invited to, to make friends and, and just to meet a legitimate need of, of, of filling people's tummies, which is awesome. And then finally, global outreach. I'm guessing all of us in here, to some form or another, our churches support uh, uh, global missionaries. So how can we be involved in that? So I just want to share briefly our story and our context. I don't want to take too much time on it. But um, we're, we're located in the bustling metropolis of Hubbard. Uh, Hubbard is just about five miles south of Park Rapids. Hubbard's not even a town. It's really a village. Uh, there's another church, and we're just located right, uh, right in that area. And like I said, Eastside is a multi-site church or a campus church of Eastside Christian Church. It's actually out of Anaheim, California. We have three campuses uh, as our church. We have one in Anaheim, one in Park Rapids, and then another one in the uh, town of La Habra, California. And um, I guess I, I got hooked up, up through uh, working with Eastside through... Uh, another pastoral friend, and um, our senior pastor is, uh, is Gene Apple. He's, he's uh, been the, the preacher at Willow Creek Community Church in South Barrington, Illinois. He's been around, um, done a lot of neat things, and uh, led some really dynamic ministries. And so it's really interesting of thinking, what in the world does a church in Southern California have anything to do, how could they have anything to do with a church in, in Northern Minnesota? And let alone maybe Duluth. You know what I mean? That's a little bit more metro. You know, but Hubbard, Minnesota, what would they have to do? So really it's more about a relationship uh, that's been, uh, been established there. Our senior pastor has been vacationing on Long Lake, which is just right across the street uh, from our church building for 50 years. His father, or his father passed away at the Park Rapids Hospital. He's got deep ties to the Minnesota area and uh, just has a love for, uh, for rural churches and believes in rural churches. And so we've had some awesome opportunities uh, since we've been there. So that's a little bit about our context. Hubbard County is an interesting place. I know we have Hubbard County people. I would classify our Park Rapids area for any of you kind of statistic, you know, <coughs> demographic nerds out there, but I would classify Park Rapids as there's a, there's a, a group or a section of people that have come and maybe they've made millions of dollars in their lifetime. Maybe they're just upper middle class and just plugged away at a job for 40 years in the factory and set aside enough money. They got a good pension. They bought a nice modest house on Potato Lake or Boot Lake and they've, they've retired there. So that's part of our, our, our section and that's people from the ages of 55 on up. There's also a demographic of people. Park Rapids is a really thriving downtown because we are a tur tourist community for most rural Minnesota downtowns. They have a really good downtown, a lot of really neat businesses. 
And so we have some business owners and some middle class people. There's a big potato plant uh, just south of us. Um, Ron Offit is kind of like the, the French fry mogul of the United States, I guess, but he's got a large potato plant there and there's a lot of potato fields around our area. So there's some um, uh, smaller demographic of business owners and then middle class folks. And then there's also a really large, what we would say, rural poverty, uh, a rural poverty selection of, of uh, the Park Rapids area and Hubbard County. So we do have a little bit of ethnic diversity in Park Rapids, a little bit. Um, but really what we see, um, we're kind of on the folks from the Leech Lake Reservation, uh, Indian Reservation come and then we're about 20 miles, 20 miles south east of the corner, the, the southeast corner of the, the White Earth Indian Reservation. So there's a little bit of that, handful of African American folks, handful of Hispanic folks, but that's just kind of, kind of who we are. Really most of our diversity comes in economic diversity, at least that's kind of what I've observed. But anyway, that's just, those are just some snapshots. These are a couple, couple young guys that we had the opportunity to baptize last winter. Uh, Keith and Alante, that's my friend Don, that's our friend Jen, and then just this past January, that's our my buddy Josh, he's a quite a talented young man and had the opportunity to baptize him in January. So, so that's just a little bit about who we are, and I, I love talking about this stuff, so I could talk about it for two more hours, but just for the sake of time, we'll cruise around. I wanted to, uh, again, I wanted to break down, so now we're, I want to talk in terms of an outreach mindset. I know each of us, and especially as a pastor, when I show up on Sunday morning, I've got about 7,000 things I'm thinking about. And when I get done at 12.30, I've got another 7,000 things I'm thinking about. So Sunday morning is really hard to kind of flip on the switch. And so I, I find I almost need to be prepared before I go. But our Sunday mornings are a really great time, uh, a really great time for outreach. Uh, whether we know it or not, we're certainly there to, to worship God, to, to gather in fellowship and pray and, and uh, uh, break bread and communion and hear God's word preached. But also there's some things to think about if we really want to have an, out, uh, an outreach mentality. Um, how, do we, how do we approach our Sunday mornings? And one of the things, this is Salisbury Cathedral in England. And just off the bat, um, I don't know if you know this, but just the presentation of our church's church architecture for centuries has said a lot about the glory, the beauty, the majesty of God. I want to I read to you a, um, a selection in the... In the 10th century, uh, Russia had just begun to be formed as sort of a nation, and uh, Prince, Prince Vladimir of Kiev had sent delegates throughout the known world to examine, uh, back, back then, uh, and even today still, states had their own religions. That, that was why, that's why we see even so much in our country, so much ethnic identity, uh, where we're at, a lot of German Catholics, German Lutherans, Scandinavian Lutherans, so if you're, if you're familiar with that, that's been kind of the name of the game for the history of the church. And so Prince Vladimir was sending people to the Muslim world. He was sending people, I believe, even down to the Buddhist world and some of the, the other places to examine these religions. And he sent them to the city of Constantinople, which is now Istanbul, if you've ever heard that song, to the, to the church of the Hagia Sophia, the church of the sacred wisdom. And uh, our, I think unarguably the, the most beautiful church that has ever been built in the history <coughs> of mankind, and these delegates went to this church building, and this is what they said. Excuse me. <clears throat> we know not whether we were in heaven or on earth, for surely there is no such splendor or beauty anywhere upon earth. We cannot describe it to you. Excuse me. I get kind of weird, I gotta keep talking or something, I don't know what's going on, but anyway. Um, this is powerful, listen to this. We can't describe it to you. Only we know that God dwells there among men. And that's, that's from a building of a church. That is from the building of a church. And that their service surpasses the worship of all other places, for we cannot forget that beauty. And there's something about beauty, whether it's in the architecture of our church, whether it's designed, there's something about our service that communicates beauty that communicates beauty. And, 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 and I understand, I remember talking about this, and I had the opportunity to, to lead a, a teach church history class a couple times at Mokum uh, Ministry Center just down the road in Cass Lake, and I talked to one of our students that's from Pine Ridge Indian Reservation. Pine Ridge is probably one of the poorest communities in the entire country. And he said, we're, we're just happy to have a building. So I understand that. So I'm not throwing that, not throwing that under the bus. But what I am saying is there's something about the beauty of architecture 
that communicates, and something about just the beauty of what's there that communicates uh, to God. And since the Reformation, Lutheran churches not so much. They're, they're pretty big on paintings and, and crosses and things like that, but more so the Reformation that was started by John Calvin out of, out of uh, Switzerland and Geneva. John Calvin's favorite quote about a church building is, the perfect church is four barren walls and a sermon. <laughs> Think about that a little bit. And they, they joke that the, the decorating choice of our, many of our Puritan forefathers was the whitewash bucket. And the reason is they didn't want to diminish the Word of God. Amen. The Word of God speaks for itself. The Word of God transforms, convicts, changes. Got it. However, we are human beings. We are human beings. And there's something about, uh, about beauty that connects, uh, connects with, with who we are. Um, and, and even that, I, I think as we... As we, as we look into that, and beauty, is, beauty, isn't, beauty isn't it alone. It, it's, beauty tells us something. It, 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 it communicates to us. We think of stained glass windows that communicate gospel stories to an illiterate people and all that kind of stuff. I think one of the things that also, and again we're talking about our Sunday morning context, is, is a, radical, a radical hospitality. I like Larry brought up St. Benedict here somewhere. St. Benedict's rule, St. Benedict was kind of the father of the modern day monastic monk communities, and one of his rules was, treat every visitor as you would treat Jesus himself. And so that every person that comes in your door is a person that's loved by God, died for by God, uh, cared for by God, and without being cheesy and giving people 30 minute long hugs. I mean, gauge people out, feel people out. There's, I like Garrison Keillor's saying about, uh, he says, up here in Minnesota, he says, a handshake goes a long way with a Lutheran, he said. <laughs> and so when we think about where we are, but there's a radical hospitality, telling people where the bathrooms are, I mean, stuff like that that's just a given. I remember attending, um, attending a couple different churches over the short course of days for each other, and it was a pretty brief service, but I remember no one talked to me, nobody asked me my name, nobody communicated to me, you know, how the service was going to go or anything like that. Uh, and those were, in, you know, 20 minutes apart from each other uh, in, uh, in very similar, very similar settings. You go, I remember going into an Applebee's six years ago. I don't really even, I mean, Applebee's I can take or leave. It's good. I mean, whatever. But um, I remember our waitress's job, her job was to make sure that being at Applebee's was the best experience I had of my week. And, and all she was, and I'm not saying she was a bad person, I'm sure she was a really nice person, because it came through in her service and her care and her concern. She was just looking for me to buy, you know, buy, buy an extra Coca-Cola and buy a dessert. That's really all she was probably looking for. But I, I, I think that, that aspect of not only beauty, but radical hospitality. So I'm just going to run through a couple things to think about uh, when we're, especially during our sermons and when we're pointing things out, and this is a little bit more of a pragmatic kind of help stuff. Do consider your context. Each of us here have a context. We do live in the 21st century. There's a lot of things that are important to people. I'll tell you, most people, this is just a, a heads up, most people probably, at least, we're talking not just even so much millennials, but if you think about people that you're guests that you want to have attend your church, they're not probably not going to read some church literature they find. Not that those things aren't important to tell who you are. They're probably going to look at your website. And so, you know what, if you're like, I'm sorry I don't have $5,000 a year for a website, that's fine. I'm just saying that's kind of the context that we're in. And so that's where things like personal invitation and all that kind of stuff come in handy. So that's just something to think about where we're at. Again, if you, uh, and again, that's the whole beyond skinny jeans thing. I don't own a pair of skinny jeans. I have thick Scandinavian legs. I don't need, <laughs> I don't work well in skinny jeans, you know what I mean? Um, but consider your context that you're in. And each of us here have an interesting and uh, wonderful context in northern Minnesota. I'm guessing most of us here from northern Minnesota. Don't jump on fads. I just want to make sure, again, I can't reinforce this enough. Outreach is not a gimmick. It's not, well, if we get this new book by Andy Stanley, well, then, man, everybody's going to get here. Or if we do the study, Crazy Love by Francis Chan, oh, man, everybody's going to be a part of this. Or if we do this, or if we, mm, not necessarily. Really, I, I love what my father-in-law says. He's been a minister for, for a number of decades. And he said, every day, every day is about, getting up and seeing what God's already doing and, and coming alongside of him. Mm -hmm. So not that those things aren't helpful. Things like the Purpose Driven Church and Purpose Driven Life that came out 20, 20 years ago really brought up some great questions for people, brought up some great principles, but that's not going to save your church or develop a necessarily even, well, it'll probably help you develop an outreach mindset, but that's not going to be the thing that's going to save your church. Do use biblical words. When we're preaching, sin is sin, salvation is salvation, Jesus is Jesus. 
You know what I mean? Um, but don't, don't feel the need to read your doctoral thesis. I, uh, I wrote down, um, you know, when you get, I actually had a friend that did this, and it was, he was in, he was in seminary at the time, so big mistake. So he's coming out with, with limited atonement or all these big crazy words. Don't read your doctoral thesis on St. Thomas Aquinas' five uses of the natural law in uh, confirming the existence of the deity. You don't, no, because if we're thinking about people, because what we're thinking about people here is, again, we're living in an increasingly bibli, biblically illiterate culture, so don't not be true. I'm not saying don't, and one of my favorite things is, is, is opportunities I've had as a teacher is always now push people just a little bit farther, just a little bit farther. But classic example, when you get up, say, hey, we're going to be looking today in the book of 2 Kings. 2 Kings is in the Old Testament. So if you turn about a fourth, you know, a fourth of your way through your Bible, you'll probably find 1 Kings. That's a, that's a given. We've got a lot of people that haven't done the sword drill thing. Um, and, and so just, just keep that in, 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 uh, in your mind. Using clear, directed language. I love what, what Tim did this morning when he urged us all to stand up. Anybody ever been in a situation? You're like, should I sit up? Should I stand down? <laughs> sit up, stand down. That was perfect. Use very clear, directive language. We're going to be seeing verses 1, 2, and 3 of leaning on the everlasting arms or whatever like that. That, that really helps people, especially guests, especially new folks. They just don't know your culture yet, and they might not be comfortable enough to just, to just jump on it. And this is another thing I think is so huge. Do not do things outside of your means to do well. Do not do things outside of your means to do well. The church we work with in California uh, is a mega church. They're a large, large church. And so when they're, on, when they're uh, up on Sunday morning, there's a 3,000 seat auditorium. There's 12 people on the worship stage. At our campus in Park Rapids, 110 people is pretty tight in our, in our sanctuary. Not only that, uh, I, I praise God for, for Michelle and Randy's son, Corbin. Corbin was not only a dear friend of mine, uh, but Corbin came, uh, Michelle and Randy McCain's son, Corbin came and helped lead worship for us in our first probably five months at Eastside and was just awesome. But our first, our first opening Sunday at Eastside, we, we started, I'm sorry, I didn't mention this, we started in uh, September of 2015, so we've only been around about 18 months. But um, we had three people on our worship team. We're not going to play some song that requires some big auditorium that's really synth heavy and a lot of padding. And, and if you've ever listened to any like Hill song, Young and Free, we just can't do that stuff well. I, it's, not that, it's not that that's not good music. It's not even so much that it doesn't translate, but it's just we can't do it well. And so I, I think one of, the things that, one of the things to really think about is what can we do well? You know what I mean? Um, I, I'll tell you, I love three, three piece band playing playing acoustic music, that's awesome. That works really well. I think it works really well here. People resonate with that. People enjoy that. But that goes in all, all aspects, especially on our Sunday morning. Don't do things outside of your means. This, anyway, just think about it. Uh, last one here, do greet guests before, during, and after the service. There's always a time and a place to greet guests. I, one of my big, that's my, my job, um, one of my main things, I'm a campus pastor, so I don't preach. I do most of the other pastoral stuff, excuse me, but I don't preach. <laughs> one of my big jobs on Sunday morning is to see, okay, without being like a chicken hawk, who are, who are the guests here? How can I meet them? How can I make a connection with them? Do I know somebody that they know? Do I, do I know where they're from? Any of that kind of stuff. That's one of the things I do and, and try to meet them. And, and um, that's, that stuff's huge. And also during our service, I just try to acknowledge that they're there. And um, interestingly enough, I have given the same set of announcements every Sunday. I've had, no, I've had two, two Sundays off since we've been there. I, I've given the same set of announcements every Sunday, to some degree or another. We have, as times change, but they're always for guests. If you're a guest, here's our next thing that we'd like to help, help you kind of take your next step with. We'd love to get to meet you. We have a gift we'd like to give you. Here's our, here's our Facebook page. Here's our Instagram page. Um, and we have a, a four-week um, discipleship class, for a better uh, use of the word, called Next Steps that I always talk about. That's not just for guests, but for everybody. So I always just try to make sure to really greet them. That's, that's one of my big jobs, and I just encourage us to be really, to be really welcoming. Um, uh, and then after the service, greet people as well. I'll tell you, one of the things that was super sweet, um, we, uh, this October, we went, my wife and I took a, took a weekend off. We went up to the North Shore. And we attended Little Zora Lutheran Church up in Tofty. And uh, it was a great, great opportunity. And I'll tell you, I felt so welcome there. 
they did an awesome job. There's 25 people in there, mm -hmm. um, and uh, just a great, a great, a great chance. I think actually he had Steve. I think he had a connection to the Free Methodists in some way. But uh, Luther Pastor there, they had a nice little gift bag for us. It had a little jar of honey. It had a little uh, like a hot pad that they knitted so you could put your um, dish on. It had a little Bible, a little ESV New Testament Bible, and a little brochure about who they were. And it was just really, it was really thoughtful. I had a great visit with the pastor. And I seek that stuff out probably a little bit more than most, but they were really kind and made sure we had that in our hands before we left. I love that. Don't point them out. Don't. My, my wife was at a service the other night, and the pastor said, hey, do we have any guests? Could you stand up? Um, not that we don't want to meet our guests. You, you already know who they are. Okay, you know who your guests are. Go greet them in an, an appropriate way, um, but don't point them out. Don't make them wear name tags. Don't. Even this is a big one. You know, there's some more liturgical churches where they have the kind of pass the peace before you have communion. Um, even the getting up and shaking hands thing. It's cool for me. I always loved it as a preacher because it kind of gave me some time before my sermon to sort of buffer it a little bit and kind of take a breath and sort of get into it. it that's actually on the top, top of the list. I didn't know this. Um, that's on the top of the list of things that make people uncomfortable because uh, I'm a pretty extroverted kind of guy. There's a lot of non-extroverts in the church. <laughs> and so that's what after the service is for. So we just put it that way. It's not that there's not going to be time to greet people, of course. That's, we want to make people feel welcome. But uh, just something to think about um, as you do that. Next one is building community. And uh, this, is, this is so huge because we, we realized, um, I had a, actually have a, a good friend who's a, a Catholic priest in the St. Cloud Diocese, and he was talking about one of their problems. He said, us Catholics, he said, we're great at greeting people at the door. You know, the classic, how are you doing? Good to see you. Hand out the bulletin, move on. But he said, he said it's, it's kind of it's like the, the, the video game Sims, where, you know, you, the, the people are doing their thing, and then you leave them alone for 10 minutes, and then after you come back to look at your people, they're in the house, they're kind of standing around looking. And he said, after two months, People may enjoy the fellowship or something else, but there's not a place for them to get involved. And so they're just kind of looking around. And I think this, this to me, is, is one of the, the bigger challenges, I think, in, in how do we get people, you know, we, we're really excited about this new couple, this new family that are happening, and we don't just want to slap them on some job so they have to stay. We certainly don't want that. But how do we help them find out a little bit more about our church? How, how even more importantly, do we find out a little bit about them, who they are? Is there a venue or an environment where we can, where we can do that? Um, how do we help people know, you know, I've been attending for a little while, what's my next step? And so we have, we have something like that at Eastside, like I said, it's called Next Steps. It's a four, four week, um, again, four week class. It's highly interactive. There's homework we talked a little bit about. And again, because our church is kind of weird, this 1800 mile gap between the Southern California church and Northern Minnesota Church, but we talk a little bit about you know, who we are, how our church started, what are our values, um, and also uh, give opportunity to people. It's for people that maybe don't know Jesus at all, and so an opportunity for their people to make that response of faith and take their next step. So that's just a question to ask, and I, I'd encourage you, I mean, this is probably the top five questions I, I would be thinking about. I know conferences are hard because you just get this fire hose of information, but what's, how would I, how would I help Assimilation it sounds kind of like the board from Star Trek, but how would I help? How do I help people take their next steps? What are some tangible next steps? And really, I think that's that's our underlying goal when we're talking about outreach. It's not just again how to get the crackhead off the street, but how do I help everybody in my congregation? How do I how do I do that? Um, small groups versus Bible studies. That's a really good question. Um, you know, I, I think a lot of us have had Bible studies. We've all participated in Bible studies. But one thing I want us to think about. And I, I realize that there's a distinct difference between small groups versus Bible studies. And I realized that two Tuesdays ago at my house. We host a small group at our home. And, um, and it was interesting. We just were having a potluck. We've been going through the Sermon on the Mount. But we had a potluck, kind of pause in the middle, take some time to be a little bit more informal and eat good food and stuff. And it was amazing. We just had kind of a time of, I know men don't like sharing, so I figure out something else you can say besides sharing. But, but uh, sharing. Sharing. You know, what's God been doing in your life? Where are you from? Why are you in Park Rapids? What brought you to Eastside? And it was, it was really funny because, you know, sometimes at the end of the service when the pastor's kind of getting to sort of his punchline, maybe the altar call moment, there's the, there's the underscoring, kind of the soft music. My wife was at the piano playing this real soft underscoring music, and it was kind of funny for a few moments, but then it got really real. 
and people are sharing about what God's doing in their life, and it was awesome. And so I realized that there's a distinct difference between a small group and a Bible study. And I think, um, not that there isn't, not that they don't overlap to some degree, but is when I think of Bible study, I think of obviously opportunity and chance to grow in the Word. But I think of really informational. I've been in a lot of Bible studies where the main job is just people to exchange their ideas about what a particular passage of Scripture says and give their opinions. And sometimes it rambles into politics, and then it's just weird. Um, <laughs> and I know there's lots of Bible studies that rock. I mean, you call it whatever you want to call it, but I'm just I'm just thinking: is there an opportunity for people can inject not just their subjective opinions? But is there an opportunity for growth together? Can God's word be preached? Can there be prayer? Can there be testimony? Can there be some way that it becomes a cohesive thing where a group of people are bonded together and they connect? Um, as opposed to just, we're here to exchange information about a particular book or a particular book of the Bible. Anyway, um, another couple questions. What are my small groups and how do I get people plugged into them? I mean, a lot of it's really it's just personal invitation. If I, if I know, it's one thing I love about small communities, small towns, is if you don't see them, Next week, you're going to see them in three weeks at the grocery store anyway. So um, what's, how do I get people plugged into small groups? Um, and also considering small groups as a way to accomplish ministries. Um, that's how John Wesley rocked the world. Some historians will say that John Wesley, the pastor, the founder of the Methodist movement, changed England, stopped the revolution. Uh, the, there's a revolution at the same time that happened in France that was an atheistic revolution where 40,000 people were beheaded in the name of freedom. But John Wesley and his organizing of small groups, and not only that, but a great heart for the poor in, in London and England, people, there's historians that would say, stop that same revolution from happening in England. So how could our small groups of people, Sunday school classes, I love quilting groups. This is a classic example of where a quilting group can come in and say, I, I, loved, I loved our quilting breaks that we would have at the Staples Church of Christ, and they were always sending blankets to Mexico. Is that an opportunity that we can take and have some sort of mission that we're involved in that bonds us together, not just as friends doing some activity, but that can be an opportunity or chance for mission. Okay, and this is another one. I actually, actually have some handouts uh, for that, that you can take back with you. This is in, in context of volunteers, and I know one thing I know about small churches is we've got one or two or three or five people that we love, love, love because they carry the weight of the ministry with us, and one of the opportunities that we have to outreach with them is to take care of them, is to take care of them well. That's one thing I'm really learning is another one of my main jobs is, okay, how do I help affirm and care for and take care of my volunteers? And I've got a really good uh, kind of leadership uh, questions that you can give to your volunteers and have them fill stuff out. But one big thing is just developing a friendship and a partnership, sharing the vision of, of your ministry together and developing a friendship. I'm not good at a lot of things. I'm really only good at one or two things. But one of the things I've realized is, and Chris and Larry and Karen, if she's in here, and Kathy can attest to, especially my first two years at White Oak. I was kind of here, there, and everywhere. But one thing I learned real quick is if people know that you love them, that goes a long way. That, that, that makes up for being 15 minutes late to a meeting a couple times. That makes up for a lot of stuff. And so can, if we can develop a genuine friendship, I'm not saying live in everybody's back pocket, but I'm just saying if we can develop a genuine friendship and a partnership, that's huge. Bring the right people in on planning or changes. Um, yeah, we know that our churches are different than they were 60 years ago. They're probably, if they're not, they probably should be just because we've seen so much change in the last 60 years. But bring the right people in on those changes. Don't just make a change and then tell people to hop on board, but bring the right people in and, and ask their opinions and, and what they think about it. Um, number three, express gratitude at appropriate times and appropriate ways. You have people that, that, I should say that, we have people that pour out their lives, that give significant chunks of change. When Eastside started in the fall of 2015, we had a guy that was rocking 30 hours a week of volunteer stuff. Now again, uh, this is, a, this is a, a grown man, no kids, but still, 30 hours a week. I mean, that's a big deal. And so maybe, I know, I know church budgets are what they are, so again, I don't want to pretend I know. But is there any way that there, there are those people that spend 10, 15, 20, 30 hours a week for you that once a year you could send them to the North Shore for two days? A couple times a year you could invite them over to your house and cook them a good steak or some gluten-free something if they don't like steak. <laughs> or is there, any way, is there any way a couple times a year just to, your, just to your people that help in Sunday school a couple times a month, you could send them a little note and say, I couldn't do this without you. I am so appreciative of you. I love to see the way that God, God's love 
shines through you as you minister to the kids and put a put a $10 gift card to Caribou or Starbucks or the grocery store or whatever. I mean, that's the kind of stuff, again, that goes a long way. And it's just little. It's All this stuff isn't some big monumental thing. Like I said, it's not some big gimmick. It's just these little things that are done with a fair amount of regularity. And the number number four is as we can. Because I know that not everybody's going to say, oh, yeah, my, my spiritual gift is cleaning toilets. Well, you may have one or two weirdos like that, but generally we, we don't have people like that. So there's a lot of people that wouldn't say my spiritual gift is whatever. But if we can do the best we can, and actually that's what that paper is for, is really kind of a sort of a guiding thing or discovery to say how do we help fit people into um, their gifts. But as much as we can, ask people, what do you like to do? That's, again, a little millennial thing. That's a, that's a next generation. What do you like to do? What do you want to do? What are you interested in? What, what excites you? And that brings us into to our next one of unleashing compassion. And that's talking about all our, all our outreach. And I'll blaze through this fast. One of the things that I, I can't stress enough, that I can't stress enough, is our importance to connect as well as we can uh, with other churches. And, and to, as much as we can, can we partner with other churches? One of the most heartbreaking statements I ever heard from a pastor was, and it actually took me a few years to process this correctly, was he said, I love when the Catholic priests in my community are awful, wicked men, because that shows people the errors of the Catholic Church. And I thought, you like that some people's only exposure to Jesus is awful and terrible and bad? What kind of divisive mindset is that? Because in all honesty, that may be the only exposure they have to Jesus, and unless you're willing to go chase him down, awesome, go for it. Do, please, I hope and pray they show up at our churches if that's the case. People that, and people get burned by all sorts of churches all the time. I was just visiting with a guy the other day that was burned by this kind of big, uh, you know, modern, new music, all that kind of stuff church in his community, terribly. So, please, let's not do that. And I'm not saying we're all going to fall on the same page theologically and even in some serious matters of truth. So I'm not here to say we all believe the same thing and whatever like that. Work with people where you can. I think Nathan right here has a classic example. He came from, uh, he served in the little town of Uppsala. And they had three churches joined together for the VBS. They had three people, three churches joined together for VBS. That's, that's resources, that's partnership, that's witnessing to the community, hey, we're, we're coming here to promote the gospel of Jesus. I'm not saying you can do that with every church in your community, so please don't, <laughs> don't hear me wrong. But I'm saying, can we start having those conversations? And maybe even can we start maybe meeting with some of those parishioners or pastors or whoever it is? I think that's a great one. Also partnering with existing agencies in town. Um, we've done work at Eastside. We've done work with the Battered Women's Shelter. Uh, we've just recently done a little project with the Pregnancy Resource Center. Are there other places in town that are doing stuff that you would like to do, but doing it better? How can you come along in helping them? You'd be surprised how much $50, or, uh, $50 worth of diapers and wipes goes for a battered woman shelter or a pregnancy center or something like that. Great stuff. Also, to con con continue to encourage your people about uh, telling stories and share people's stories of success. If you've got people in your, com in your church that have adopted three kids, that's a big deal. Hubbard County, I think I heard, has 400 kids in the foster system. If you have people that have adopted children that are doing awesome things like that, maybe that don't get noticed, don't, don't be afraid to tell these stories. I'm going to conclude with this last one nice, hard, and fast.